see, so what, what God is endeavoring to do with his church in these last days is to bring us down from this place of the mysterious and get us planted on the firm foundation of his word. That's what God wants us to do. He wants us to believe what his word says. And that should always be the goal of us Christians is to base what we believe on the word of God. All right, so we're going to continue in our series about divine health. And the name of the sermon today is called God's Word Reveals God's Will to Heal. God's Word Reveals God's Will to Heal. Now, maybe you're wondering, why are you teaching about healing? The reason is, is because you could ask different people in the body of Christ about healing and get so many different answers. See, there's a segment of the body of Christ that if you ask them to define healing, they would say it's a historical event. They would say there was a time in the early church where God used the miraculous to get his little fledgling church jump started. But after that, there was no more need for the miraculous. There was no more need for healing. There was no more need for those things because now we have the written word. So if you ask them to define healing, they would say it was history, right? That God just turned off his power and now we have a book, but we have no power. Now, the larger segment of the body of Christ, if you were to ask the majority of the people in the body of Christ today to define healing, and, and we were all just to be honest with us, the answer we would normally get would be a divine mystery. A divine mystery, right? We know he can, but his ways are mysterious. True? Yes, no? But see, here's the, here's the amazing thing. If, if any person alive today had the privilege to sit down right now, face to face, flesh to flesh with Jesus and ask him to define healing, he would say salvation. And here's the stripes to prove it. That's how Jesus would define healing. See, so what what. God is endeavoring to do with his church in these last days is to bring us down from this place of the mysterious and get us planted on the firm foundation of his word. That's what God wants us to do. He wants us to believe what his word says. And that should always be the goal of us Christians is to base what we believe on the word of God because this is the source of truth. So what I want to do is I want to talk about what God's word says about this very important thing. And I want to start by introducing this foundational cornerstone of the Christian faith. And, and one of these foundational cornerstones is this, that if you want to know what God's will is, you find it here. This is where you find God's will. His will is found in his word. So, you can look at foundations, right? If you look at any building, it starts off with its foundation. When I got a chance to go to Israel, we got to go to the, the city of Jerusalem, right? And they still have the Western Wall there, right? Some call it the Wailing Wall. And it's the only remaining retaining wall from the original Temple Mount. And it was built by hand in the second century B.C., can you imagine? It, it, it's, it's, it's been in place since the second century BC. And it was built using a cornerstone. So they would dig down to bedrock and they would place a giant stone that was perfectly level and square. And then they would use that as the anchor so that the whole building would be unmovable, unshakable. Well, this temple was destroyed by the Babylonians first in 587 BC. The second temple was destroyed in, by the Romans in 70 AD. But if you go to Jerusalem in 2022, what still exists is the foundation. 
they knocked down the upper part of the wall, but the foundation is still there. There are tours that you can go on where you go under the ground and you can put your hands on the cornerstone. You could literally put your hand on the original stone that was put there in 2 BC. Because the temple that represents the presence of God is based on a cornerstone, a firm foundation. And so is our Christian belief system. It's supposed to be built on a firm foundation called his word. So Jesus talked a lot about foundation. So if you go to your notes and you read Matthew 7, 24 through 27, Jesus begins to talk about a firm foundation. He says, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine, he's talking about his word, the word of God, and acts on them will be like a wise man who built his house on a rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and slammed against that house, yet it did not fall, for it had been founded on the rock. So he's talking about the, the rock of his word. And then he says, and Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them, does not live by them, will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and slammed against the house, and it fell. And its collapse was great. Right? So Jesus is saying that there is a foundation called the Word of God that he intends us to live our life by, and that is, it is supposed to be the firm foundation. But I want us to understand something that's even more important. Jesus is also called the Word of God. Right? Is Jesus called the Word of God? So in John 1, 1 through 5, it talks about Jesus. And it says, In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him, the Word, was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness and darkness did not comprehend it. So what this is telling us is the life of Jesus is the living expression of his written word. The life of Jesus is the living expression of God's written word. So when you see the life and ministry of Jesus, you're seeing him fulfilling God's written word. That's really important for us to understand. We also see this about Jesus in 1 John 1, 4. It confirms what I'm saying. It says, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So it confirms that Jesus became the living expression of God's word. But it also tells us that Jesus is the exact imprint of, of God's nature. So Hebrews 1.3 says, the Son, Jesus, is the radiance of God's glory and the exact imprint of his divine nature. So if you want to know what God is like, look at Jesus. Because he is the exact representation of the Father. Jesus is the exact representation of the Father. So if you're hearing somebody describe God in a way that you're not seeing Jesus live, then what they're saying is not correct because Jesus is the exact representation of the Father. Here's the other part we have to understand. Jesus perfectly revealed the Father's will. Jesus perfectly revealed the Father's will. So John 6.38, Jesus says this, I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. So if you want to know the will of God, study the life of Jesus, because he is the living expression 
of the written word of God. And he says in, in John 14, 10, he begins to talk to his disciples about his life. And he says, don't you believe that the Father is living in me and that I'm living in my Father? Even my words are not my own, but come from my Father. For he lives in me and performs his miracles of power through me. So Jesus is saying that God is fulfilling his will through me because I am his divine expression on the earth. That is what Jesus is saying. <clears throat> so what I want to do is I want to look at these, these three powerful passages of Scripture, and I want us to look at what we're seeing here in the life of Jesus. So in Matthew 4, 23 through 25, it says, Jesus traveled throughout the region of Galilee, teaching in the synagogues and announcing the good news about the kingdom. And he healed every kind of disease and illness. News about him spread as far as Syria, and people soon began bringing to him all who were sick. And whatever their sickness or disease, or they were demon-possessed or epileptic or paralyzed, he healed them all. Large crowds followed him wherever he went. People from Galilee, the ten towns, Jerusalem, from all over Judea and from the east of the Jordan River. So now we have another account. Another account later in Matthew in 8, 14 through 17 says, Then Jesus entered Peter's home and found Peter's mother-in-law bedridden, severely ill with a fever. The moment Jesus touched her, she was healed. Immediately she got up and began to make dinner for them. That evening, the people brought to him many who were demonized, and by Jesus only speaking a word of healing over them, they were totally set free from their torment. Everyone who was sick received their healing. In doing this, Jesus fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah. He put upon himself our weaknesses. He carried away our diseases and made us well. Now, one last time in Matthew 15... 20 through 31, so three different events. After leaving Lebanon, Jesus went to Lake Galilee and climbed a hill nearby and sat down. Then huge crowds of people streamed up the hill, bringing with them the lame, blind, deformed, mute, and many others in need of healing. They lay them at Jesus' feet, and he healed them all. And the crowds marveled with amazement, astounded over the things they were witnessing with their own eyes. The lame were walking, the mute were speaking, the crippled were made well, and the blind could see. For three days, everyone celebrated the miracles as they exalted and praised the God of Israel. Now, depending on the translation you're reading, you hear this described as great crowds, large crowds, um, great or great multitudes, right? So depending on the translation. But if you look at like the King James, which is one of the older translations, it uses the word great multitudes. Now, the Hebrew culture, a multitude is at least 10,000 people. So it's a minimum of 10,000 people. But how many is it if you say great in front of that and then add an S? <laughs> right? It says great multitudes. So we don't know for sure, the amount of people who came to Jesus. But one thing we do know is this. In the Hebrew culture, they only counted the men. Right? So the great multitudes that they're talking about was only the men. They were only counting the men. Right? So were there any women folk, do you think, that might have needed to be healed? Do you think there might have been some children folk that needed to be healed? Of course. So what I'm trying to help us understand is the magnitude of the people. There could have potentially been hundreds of thousands of people that came to Jesus. Hundreds of thousands. And, and if you look at what the Bible is telling us, and it's important for us to understand this, it always says the same thing. He healed them all. 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 There's no place in Scripture where it shows anybody coming to Jesus who did not get healed. There's an important lesson there for us. So what I want us to do is, is after I've read that, now I want to go back to these, 
biblical evidences I've presented before about Jesus and the word and see if they line up and we could get a consensus based on God's word what we're supposed to understand about this, right? So the first thing we could understand if you read the scriptures, and again, don't take my word for it. You have the scriptures in front of you. Read it for yourself, right? This, you have to develop your own belief system based on the word. So if you read the word, can we come to this agreement? Everyone who came to Jesus was healed. Based on the word of God, everyone who came to Jesus was healed. Can we see based on what the scripture says about Jesus can we agree with the statement that Jesus only does the will of the Father? That, that's right there in the word, right? Can we come to the conclusion based on the word of God that God's written word reveals God's will? Okay. Can we agree based on the word of God that Jesus is the living expression of God's written word? Yes? Can we also agree that based on the word, that Jesus is the exact imprint of the Father's nature. Just based on the word. Not my opinion, not my sermon, just based on the word. Right? It says it over and over again that Jesus is the exact representation or the exact expression of the Father. So now, when God was revealing himself to his people in the Old Testament, and he gave us these I am statements, he was saying, I am, I never change. Right, I'm the unchanging God. One of the unchanging names that he used was Jehovah Rapha, the God who heals. So when you look at his nature, when you look at all the evidence that the word of God says, what conclusion should we come to about God's will to heal? It's his will. You, if you just went by Scripture, there's no denying it. There's no getting around it, right? It's everywhere in Scripture. And, and these are the two things I want you to understand. The life and ministry of Jesus were a prophetic picture of two things. The first one is this. His, the, the life of Jesus, the ministry of Jesus, was a prophetic picture of what was included in salvation, important to understand. The life of Jesus, the ministry of Jesus was a prophetic picture of what was, hap what was going to be made available through salvation. The second thing we have to understand is the life and ministry of Jesus, it also reveals how he intended for us to receive salvation. When you look at how Jesus were coming to him to receive, it was the same way that people receive salvation today it has not changed so we have to look at the life of jesus to see why he came so my encouragement to you as your pastor is to study the life and ministry of jesus fall in love with jesus see it's not about establishing a theology. It's about falling in love with the one who came to do these things for us, right? Because he created, he did all this so that we can walk in a relationship with him to experience what God intended from the beginning, right? So I want you to study the life and the ministry of Jesus, but not just from a theological standpoint. I want you to get to know the person of Jesus. And when you do, your life will be forever changed, because he's awesome. He's amazing. But, but here's the point I want you to make. I want to make to you. The reason that there is so much confusion about what salvation means is because there are theologians that are saying things about salvation that Jesus never said. And there are theologians that are not saying things about salvation that Jesus did say, right? So if you want to know what Jesus was talking about, follow him, right? Listen to him. He knows. 
He came for this. He planned it before the foundation of the world. He knows what he meant. He knows why he came. So if you want to know what Jesus was doing, find it through him. See, one of the things that, we, that, that I found, I worked in retail for many years, you guys know that. About 10 years ago, it seems like, we began to have a problem with counterfeit $100 bills. Anybody part of exchanging money? We started having these counterfeit problems, right? So they, now there's a pen. You just swipe it, and it tells you, I guess, based on the color, if it's a good bill or not. But if you really want to know the difference between real and counterfeit, do you study the counterfeit? You don't. You study the real, right? You study the real until you become so familiar with the real that if somebody hands you a counterfeit, you go, eh, and you know immediately. That is why we need to study the life and ministry of Jesus. Because then, if somebody comes with a counterfeit, immediately you go, no, no, mm -mm, no. That is not what Jesus said. That is not what I see when I look at Jesus. We have to know what he said and what he did, and we have to build our lives upon the truth of what he said. Because he is the author and finisher of our faith. So he gets to have last word, right? He's supposed to have last word. So when you look at the life of Jesus, when you see what we've been reading about all these people coming to him and everyone that comes to him receives their healing, is this a prophetic picture of salvation? That's what you have to settle in your heart. If it is, then you will have seen that throughout Scripture. Well, over the last five or six weeks, have you seen that over and over and over and over again? Every Scripture from both the Old and the New Testament that describes salvation has healing in it. I didn't know that growing up. I, didn't, I wasn't taught that in seminary. But it's everywhere in Scripture. Right? Psalm 103, he forgave all my sin and healed all my diseases. Isaiah 35, and when he comes to save, blind eyes will be open, deaf ears will be open, the lame will leap like a deer. Isaiah 53, he bore my sin. By his stripes, I was healed and made whole. Matthew says, quoting Isaiah, he bore my sickness, carried away my diseases, and made me well. Peter says, his own self bore my sin in his own body on the tree that we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness by his stripes. I was healed. See, every verse that speaks about salvation includes healing. But if that's not enough for you, Jesus, the master, when he described it in Matthew 9, and I didn't put it in your notes, but in Matthew 9, he's having a debate with the religious leaders, again. And he's, he turns to them and says, what is easier to say? Your sins are forgiven or be healed? But to prove that the Son of Man has the authority on the earth to forgive sins. And then he looks to a paralyzed man and he says, rise up and walk. And the man stands up and walks away. Because it was a picture of what Jesus was going to do through his death, burial, and resurrection. If you just look at the word of God, there is no way to contest why Jesus came. But the problem is there's so many opinions based on people. But we have to do is we have to take those opinions and we have to hold them up to the standard of God's word, right? Because Jesus said this is the foundation, right? If it's not part of the foundation, then it's not part of the truth. See, one of the things that we've all been taught is that God chooses to heal some and not the other. We've all heard that. That's why there's this big mystery. But see, you have to ask yourself, 
you have to look to Jesus because he's the exact expression of the Father. So if that were true, then there would have to be someone who came to Jesus and there would have to be some kind of interview, right? Because again, if, if, if he's going to discuss, if he's going to decide to do it for some and not others, there has to be a reason, right? So wouldn't there have to be some earthly qualifications for him to decide? Or is he just randomly saying, I just don't like you. You're from Nazareth, right? You're from Fiddletown, you know, whatever, right? There, ha- there would have to be some sort of work. There would have to be some sort of behavior for Jesus to decide, hmm, no, you don't qualify. But if you read the Bible, you'll never see anywhere where there is a pre-healing interview. Never, ever, ever. There's no place where anybody shows up with a letter from their rabbi. And the rabbi says, they do keep 613 Jewish laws. And they keep the Ten Commandments. Here's their giving records. And here's their attendance records. It's not anywhere in Scripture. There's no place in Scripture that shows that. So, the reason that we know that Jesus is not choosing it's because we understand that what he is doing is a picture of salvation. So, are you saved by works? So nobody would think that you would come to Jesus and ask forgiveness of sins and have him do an interview with you, right? Nobody would ever think that, right? Because we know that salvation is by grace and grace alone, yes? Yes? But see, what if we understood what Jesus is trying to tell us and we understood that he bore our sin and our sickness? And what if we came to him with the same faith to be healed as forgiveness? Because that's what he designed. That's what he intended. See, here's the crazy thing. I thought about this the other day. The people in Jesus' day would have had an easier time receiving healing from him than our kids today do receiving healing a gift from Santa. Because Jesus didn't even ask if you were naughty or nice. He never even asked if you were naughty or nice. See, so we, so we, we understand that, that what Jesus did, everything that Jesus was doing in the ministry was an act of grace. It was the love of God being manifested toward people. Right? It was the restoration back to God's design and intent so that everything that Jesus was doing was to restore what was lost in the fall. God never intended for us to live this way. If you look in the garden, his design for Adam was physical, spiritual, and emotional health. And if you just go by what Scripture says, that's how Jesus describes salvation. Restoration back to God's design and intent. So now if you look at how were people receiving from Jesus, right? If, we, if we've come to the conclusion that what Jesus was doing was revealing what salvation was, now we can look at how they received and we can learn something from that. So let me just use a modern day parable if I could because it'll be easier for you to understand it kind of in a story form. So let's just say there was a young man named Levi and he's 21 years old and he's in the region of Galilee and he's just visiting his his aunt and uncle. While he's there, he sees these massive crowds and like any 21 year old boy, he's curious. So he walks up and he begins to see what is happening with Jesus and these people. And he stands there for two hours and he's awestruck, right? Because blind eyes are open and deaf ears are open and the lame begin to walk and people with deformed legs start to have a leg grow out and they have, suddenly they have ankles and feet and toes and toenails. And he's like, oh my gosh, what is happening? And he watches this and he's just in awe. But he realizes it's time to go home. So on his five-mile journey home, he runs across a beggar that's crippled on the side of the road. And he says, what's your name? My name is Matthew. My name is Levi. Let me tell you what I just saw. 
and he began to describe what he just saw. And he says, Matthew, you have got to go to Jesus because everyone who came to Jesus was healed. Now, who would determine or what would determine whether Matthew went or not? What he believed, right? If he believed that what Levi was saying was real, that would be a determining factor, right? But would it just be belief? Or would there be some element of faith to it? See, we've talked about, Jesus talked about two things over and over again. When you look at the life of Jesus, he says two things over and over again when he's dealing with people that are receiving from him. It's always belief and faith. That's the only thing that he ever talks about is belief and faith, right? Belief is trusting in the word. Faith is simply acting upon what you believe. So if Matthew believed that what Jesus was doing was true, yet he decided not to go, would he receive from Jesus? But all he had to do was believe and jump on Levi's shoulders and let him carry him fireman style to Jesus. And if he comes to Jesus, is he going to be healed? Everyone, everyone. Do you get the picture of that? See, what Jesus is doing is a picture of salvation. And the way you receive salvation is by what you believe and then what you do. And it's, it's just, look at what, I didn't put it in my notes, but Romans 10, 9 talks about salvation. Believe in your heart and then it describes faith and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you'll be saved. There's just one standard. But see, there's been so much confusion. Now we have standards that the Bible doesn't say. We have all kinds of stuff that the Bible doesn't say. And that's where the confusion comes. So what if we got back to just believing Jesus? So, so let me just show you some words about what, what the Bible says about salvation. And let's see if that clears things up for us. Right, one of the more famous passages of Scripture about salvation is Ephesians 2, 8, 9. Right? For by grace you have been saved through faith, not of yourself. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So here the Apostle Paul is describing salvation and he's telling us how we receive it. Is he not? That's what he's talking about right here. So grace, when he's describing grace, he's talking about God's part. He's saying grace is God's part. It's the part that's been paid through Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. That's the part that's already been done. So now when you see these passages of scriptures in the Bible, they always talk about past tense. All of God's promises have been fulfilled in Christ Jesus with a resounding yes. Right? It's all pointing to something that's already been paid for, isn't it? So what Paul is saying is grace is God's part. So has Jesus been to the cross? Has he been to the grave? Did he come out victorious? 2,000 years ago, there's no question about that. No theologian, theologian can debate that. The only question is what did he do while he was there? Well, the Bible's very clear about that. There's no question about that. If you just stand on the word of God, there's no question as to what Jesus did and what he paid for on the cross. So the, the question becomes, can we put it in the right tense? Can we understand that what Jesus is saying is I've already accomplished it? I've already accomplished it. Could you be born again? Could you receive forgiveness of sins if Jesus had not done it yet? You could not. You have to believe in something that has already happened. You have to respond to something that's already happened. Well, if you look at what Jesus says about salvation, you'll see what already happened. So it's talking about grace. And then it talks about this 
word called saved. Well, here's the confusion. What does it mean to be saved according to the Bible? Does it mean that you get a golden ticket to miss hell and you go to heaven someday? I mean, heaven's real, and, and, and that's part of it. And, and if you're born again, you are going to spend eternity in a place that's beyond measure. You'll never, your mind will never even understand how beautiful and amazing heaven is going to be because it's going to be the personification of the love of God. But is that all that it is? That's not all that it is. See, Jesus, when he came, he came saying that he came to bring heaven to earth. Did he say that? Well, ask yourself a question. Is there sickness in heaven? Is there disease in heaven? None of those came through God. So he's coming to reestablish what God designed on the earth. So if you look at the word salvation, we talked about this a couple weeks ago, but we should keep talking about it until we believe it. So the word saved the Greek word is called sozo, S-O-Z-O, and it's translated in the New Testament 54 different times. And it means saved, healed, made whole, preserved. So 54 times in the Gospels it's used, meaning three different things. It means to be delivered from disease or demon possession. It means to be rescued from physical life or from impending peril or doom. Right, so now you have eternal life. Right, because death came through sin. And it also means spiritual salvation or spiritual and emotional wholeness. So what Jesus is describing as salvation needs to be what we're describing as salvation, doesn't it? Because he's the author of the book. And no man, no woman has a right to change the book without the author's permission. Can we agree with that? If I just took somebody's book and changed it, I would get sued, right? You can't just take somebody's book and change the meanings of it. But all you have to do is, is listen to what's being taught and you'll see that there are things that are being taught that are not in the scripture. There are things that we are saying about Jesus that Jesus is not saying about himself. There are things that we are not saying about Jesus that Jesus is clearly saying about himself. And we, as Christians, have to side with Jesus because he's the author of this thing. See, as, as you look at, at the, the Gospels now, I promise you one thing, you're never going to see it the same way again. You're ruined. Because now your, your lens has been opened up and you're going to see things differently. And one of the things you're going to see over and over again when you look at the Gospels is you're going to hear a phrase, they came to hear and be healed. They came to hear and be healed. Right? Because faith comes by hearing. Well, what were they hearing when they came to be healed? What we call salvation. They were hearing the gospel. And when they heard the gospel, they had faith to be healed. Why? Because when Jesus preached it, he preached it the way he meant it. So every time he preached the gospel, people heard the gospel and got healed. If you read in the book of Acts, you'll see the same thing. And in the book of Acts, Paul is in the town of Lystra, and he's preaching, in the middle of his sermon, he perceives the man has faith to be healed. Why? Because he preached the gospel. Because he preached the gospel. He had faith to be healed because he heard the gospel. Now, we live in a culture right now, and, and, and we are waiting for Jesus to come back, right? I mean, it's, I think it's more so than any other time. And people are just like, come, Lord Jesus, now. Please come. Like, whoo, come on now. Hurry, hurry, hurry back, right? And, and when, when you talk to people 
about the coming of Jesus, one of the things that you hear over and over again is they, they've, they've become convinced that Jesus returning is based on some sort of current event, right? So if there's a certain war between certain people, then that's the, that's the time for, for the trumpet to happen and Jesus is going to return, right? We've got it all tied to these historic events, right? But, but let me read to you what Jesus says, because again, have I established his words are pretty important today? So here's what Jesus says about his return. So Jesus answered and said to him, what do you want me to do for you? Oh, let's try the right scripture. Sorry about that. That was a good one too. Matthew 24, 14, he says this, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations, then the end will come. So if you read that passage in Matthew 24, he's talking about wars and rumors of wars. He's talking about all those things. And yes, that's part of it. But Jesus says this. When the gospel of the kingdom is preached to every nation, then I'll come back. Well, why does he specifically say the gospel of the kingdom? Do you think that the all-knowing God was shocked when men began to change the gospel? Do you think he was like, I never saw that coming. I would have done things differently. He was not shocked by that. And Jesus is saying very specifically, when my people preach the gospel of the kingdom to every nation, that's when I'm coming back. Because he's not coming back because of, a, of, a, of, a, of, of an event. He's coming back for a family. Do you understand? The reason Jesus has not come yet is because there's not enough people in his family. He's waiting for a harvest of souls, of people. And people come to Jesus when they hear the truth about why he came. So when people begin to preach what Jesus preached, we will see people coming in droves to Jesus to receive him. And then when that happens and Jesus is satisfied, then he's going to come back and he's going to make everything perfect again. But we have to understand what Jesus meant when he said the gospel of the kingdom. That's what Jesus preached, the gospel of the kingdom. And that's what we are supposed to be preaching the gospel of the kingdom. It's the restoration back to God's design and intent on the earth. He loves you more than you could ever imagine. And he came to set you free so you could live a life of love and joy and peace and patience and goodness and kindness, physical, spiritual, and emotional health. That's why he came for you and for me.